hear me? I'm Faye Gersh. I'm president of the Hemlock Society of San Diego. Uh, we rarely have meetings in La Jolla, so I'm very happy to see you all, especially on a Monday morning. I was afraid there'd be more speakers than audience, but you all turned out. How many of you saw the ad in the La Jolla Light? Or not the ad, but the blurb. And Carmel Valley News, I saw somebody at the Reader, the UT. Just always curious about how you got here. Other places that? Yeah, San Diego Union. Union Tribune, OK. OK. Um, and how many are, are here for the first time at a Hemlock meeting? Oh, my gosh. Well, super well. So let me just take a few minutes to say what we're about. The Hemlock Society of San Diego used to be an affiliate of the National Hemlock Society, which no longer exists because it merged. Long story. So we're one of the few, two, actually, Hemlock Societies in the country. And this is our 30th year in San Diego. To celebrate that, in November, November 4th, we're having an all-day conference on everything we have learned in 30 years to achieve a peaceful death. You can register now, early registration until October 10th, and then uh, members are um, uh, less than uh, non-members, so you can join and save yourself some money, because we'd love to have you join as a member. We are a membership organization. We are a 501c3, so all contributions and memberships are tax deductible. And our mission in life is to educate the San Diego community about all the end of life options as they come online, as we know about them, as we would like to see them happen, because not all the end of life options that we would like to see are now legal. So we'll talk about the differences. Today, we're talking about what used to be the new law, now a year old in California, the End of Life Option Act. And that is a quantum leap in the rights that we've had so far because it permits physician or medical aid in dying. So what we've had so far actually uh, California was the first to have a living will law way back in 1976, which most states thought was pretty crazy, but we initiated that, and in 1983, we're the first state to have a durable power of attorney for health care, which, of course, you all have appointed somebody to be your health care agent. These are not God-given rights. These are hard-fought rights that have happened over the years. Uh, we have the right to refuse any unwanted medical treatment. We have the right to refuse food and hydration. We have the right to have hospice care at the end of our lives. So there are a lot of things that we now have, although we have to make sure they're not turned back with the new administration. But having aid in dying is different from refusing treatment. So we've had the right to refuse treatment for a long time. But this is more active. This is for people who are at the end of their lives who find they're, uh, they don't want to die, maybe a natural death. They want to determine the time and manner of their own death. And they want to do it peacefully. And they have to plan for it. We'll talk about what the law involves and how you can be ready to take advantage of it if it interests you. So we have three speakers today. One of them is not here yet. Um, Bill Simmons is on our board. He's a local attorney, and he's going to talk about the legal aspects of the law. He also put a summary of the law on most of the chairs here. The law is, I think, 26 pages, but we have summarized it into one page, and Bill will talk about what it does and doesn't do. And uh, Dr. Bob Uslander is expected, and he'll talk about what a private practitioner a uh, concierge doctor, concierge hospice and palliative care doctor, can do to help you use the law and maybe other methods of achieving a peaceful death. And I'll chime in whenever. I'd like to talk about what the law doesn't do and where we go from here. I feel pretty strongly about that because we have, even though we've struggled for 30 years to get where we are now, we have a long way to go to really for everybody to know that they can die peacefully. So I'll start with Bill Simmons, who will talk about the legal aspects, since he is a lawyer. 
Thank you, Faye. I put out on the seats, at least most of the seats, this one-page summary. They referred to it, so I didn't have quite enough for every seat. So if you don't have one, maybe there's others. How many people do not have one? Well, seven. If you people could be are sitting couples, on it. Uh, you could share a couple and maybe pass, pass them around. I'm sorry, I'm out. It's on our website. It is on our website. Himlock San Diego. Himlock Society San Diego. Himlock Society. I'm not going to go through this in the sense that I'm going to read it, but I'm going to give you the basics of what the law is. First, and I'm going to kind of look at it from your point of view as if you were the one that wanted to take advantage of this law. But keep in mind, a lot of people don't know the details of this law, so you need to know what this law is when you talk to other people as well. Okay, who qualifies? You have to be over 18. I think everybody here kind of qualifies for that. Uh, you have to be a California resident. That's not an issue. Uh, but it was an issue. Remember the young lady, Maynard? She had to go to Oregon because we didn't have the law then. So residency can be an issue. Um, you have to be terminally ill. And I will discuss what that is in a moment. You have to be mentally competent. That is, you have to have all your facilities, mental facilities. You've got to be able to think and understand what you're doing. And you have to be physically, you have a question, sir? Well, I, how do they determine mental competency, though? <laughs> well, that's up to the doctors. I'll discuss that in a minute. Okay. Uh, but you've opened up a can of worms that <laughs> I'm going to avoid right now. <laughs> Uh, and you have to be physically competent, down here? physically able to uh, ingest the medication because the law prohibits the doctor from injection. You have to physically be able to ingest it or maybe there's alternatives, but nobody can help you. If anybody helps you, they can go to jail. In other words, maybe everybody should understand this. It's not a crime anymore. Can I help you get seated? There's one seat here. There's a seat. We can bring up more chairs. Sure. If you have an empty seat next to you, would you raise your hand so people don't have to stand up in the back? And we can drag out more chairs. There are some more chairs in here. I think we have enough, Faye. We do? Yeah. There, there's still three or four empty chairs, plus yeah. there's the bench in back. I think we're all right. Back benches. OK, I'd like to resume. Um, I was talking about the law in the sense that nobody can help you ingest the medication because that's assisting suicide. Assisting suicide is a felony. Committing suicide is not. Have a so, you, hi, Bob, welcome. This is Dr. Bob Uslander, who will talk later, and I'll introduce him formally at that time. So, in, in all states, really, it's no longer the law to commit suicide. It used to be if you committed suicide or failed to commit suicide, you could go to jail. <laughs> didn't make a lot of sense, so they did away with that. But what they didn't do away with was assisting suicide. So if you assist someone to commit suicide or to ingest this medication, which in a sense is suicide, we don't call it suicide. Thank you. Um, that person can go to jail. It's a felony. So it's not a crime if I do it myself. It is a crime if somebody helps me. And that's an important thing to remember. All right, you have to physically be able to ingest. Yes? 
do you have to purchase the medication yourself? Okay, I'll get into that, and we'll probably get into that later. Maybe we could hold the questions till Bill's finished, and then he'll probably answer all the questions you have. If not, he will then. Okay, now what's the process? You know, you know, so let's assume you're eligible. Somebody, some doctors told you you have less than six months to live. That's what we mean by terminally ill. It's a, a time period that's set really by federal law, but it's been adopted in California and all the other states that have this kind of law so that they dovetail. So you have to be in the opinion of two doctors that you're terminally ill. Um, your first job is to find a doctor who's willing to go down this path with you. And that will probably be the subject of much of the conversation later on. <clears throat> I don't want to get into now other than to say finding a doctor can be the biggest hurdle in this whole process. The second thing is you have to make an oral request to the doctor. You have to ask the doctor for a prescription to end your own life. Then you have to consult with the doctor. The doctor needs is required by law sit down with you and discuss um, what's happening, what your terminal situation is, how long you have to live, uh, do you understand that you're requesting that you, to end your own life? So the doctor's going to determine that you know what you're doing. That's the first determination that you're mentally confident. <coughs> Uh, the doctor will discuss alternatives with you. You know, you don't have to take your own life. Maybe just palliative care is all that you need, and I'm sure Bob will get into that. Uh, hospice is another alternative. In other words, you decide to stop aggressively treating your, uh, your disease, whatever it is, often it's cancer, uh, and you've, you're kind of resigned that you're on the, the slow path to death. And you can go to hospice, and they, the purpose of hospice is to help you <coughs> feel comfortable while you end your life. And hospice is only available during those last six months of life. Okay, so the doctors kind of run through all this stuff with you in a private cons consultation. Then you, the doctor will give you a form to sign that says that you have indeed reviewed all these things with the doctor, you understand what you're doing, and you've been advised of all your options. So the doctor is going to take you through all these different steps that I just mentioned. Then that form has to be witnessed by two people, and there's certain limitations on who those two people could be. You have to make a second request to the same doctor 15 days or so later, but not less than 15 days. You have to see a second doctor who will kind of go through the same process that you just went through with your, your primary, your new doctor, I'll call him your primary doctor. Um, so you have to see a second doctor just to confirm what your first doctor has already determined. Now, if either one of those doctors has a doubt about your mental competence, then either doctor can refer you to a third doctor or a psycho psychologist, a psychiatrist or a psychologist. So you'll go to a third doctor in this case for a mental evaluation. Are you competent enough to understand what you're doing? You know, you, there are different rules about competency. It's not the most stringent rule of competency that the doctors apply, and Bob can go into more detail about what competency is from a doctor's point of view. <coughs> so you finally, you've gone through all these steps, and you've set a date to take your own life. Two days before that date, 
you have to sign, and you're required by the law to sign, an attestation form, and send it back to the doctor. In this form, you again say, I know what I'm doing, I'm, I'm taking my own life, and so on. This particular final piece of paper is not required in the other states that have this law. The other states are Oregon, who had the first law of this kind, Washington, um, and Vermont, and now uh, Colorado and Washington, D.C. have recently adopted this law. They're also in Montana, there was a court decision that would allow a doctor to give a lethal medication. But there's no, in, in that state, there's no process by which we have to go through in, in this state. <coughs> okay, so now you've done the attestation. Somewhere along the line, you've gone to the pharmacist and, pharmacist and pick up your prescription, or you've had somebody pick it up. It's kind of an interesting twist in the law about the prescription, the lethal prescription. The doctor cannot hand it to you. You're used to going to the doctor and being handed a, a piece of paper, which is the medic prescription. Can't happen under this law. The doctor has to physically get, take it to the pharmacist or send it electronically, i.e. by email. They, they're taking you out of the process. So just, I think, to prevent forgery and things like that. But you are allowed to pick it up yourself or you can have somebody else pick it up for you. But they can send it to you. So you've got the medication, you've signed your attestation form, now you you set the date, you've talked to your family, and that's the most important thing in all of this, I think, is that you have the opportunity to talk to your loved ones, to your close friends, and say goodbye. And that's why we don't call it suicide. Because in typical suicide, People are alone, they're depressed, and they do violence to themselves. This is not a violent act. You have to prepare or have someone else prepare the medication because it doesn't come in a pill. There's no such thing as the final pill. Um, there are different medications, Bob will get into this, that are available. Um, they have a special one in Washington. There are different combinations that um, compounding pharmacies put together, or there are medications that are basically sleep medications. If you take enough of them, like a hundred of them, that's considered a lethal dose. So if you have, uh, unless you have the, the special medication made up by the pharmacy, and you're taking a hundred pills, you have to take them apart and mix them into some kind of liquid or jello or something like that. Uh, they're very bitter. And you have to take it all at one time. And most doctors will also subscribe, prescribe something for you so that you don't throw this back up. You need to keep it down. So they'll give you a medication maybe 20 minutes, 30 minutes before Bob can tell us exactly, uh, that you take this pre-medication so that you don't vomit. So when the time comes, you finally take this medication, you'll go to sleep fairly quickly, and you'll die within 20 minutes or so. That's the process. And that's kind of the outline of the law. The law, as Faye said, is many, many pages. We have boiled it down very uh, carefully on this one page. So don't lose this one page, because you may not remember everything I've, I've told you. And if you short a page, because I don't have enough for everybody here, uh, let me know, give me your name or your email, and I'll send it to you. I think that's all I, I want to go through now. Uh, the cost of the medication can be anywhere from, if you're lucky, $400 to three to $5,000. And other speakers will get into that issue. Um, the attitude of hospices, some hospices will cooperate with you, some will not. That's another issue that we may want to discuss. I hope we can have a good 
question and answer period after we get through. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. Thank you. We advise you to talk to your doctor now. Just theoretically, if I need this, would you participate in using the law? And if they need advice on how to or what it is, we are happy to provide that. If they say absolutely not, we might look elsewhere. Kaiser will, at Kaiser and UCSD will provide somebody to take care of this. If you ask your doctor, they refer you to the person they have assigned to find a doctor to go through the process. Kaiser will also pay for the medications. So there's a lot of other things to know about it. Uh, but the main thing is if you're planning to use this, and I've had this experience many times, where people call me on the brink of death and say, well, I'd like to use that new law, there's not time. You know, it's a 15-day waiting period, finding a doctor, getting the drugs and all that. So you have to plan ahead for it. But I'm going to let, this is Dr. Bob Uslander, who is with, has founded Integrated MD Care. He's a private practice uh, concierge hospice and palliative care physician. I think he can do a better job of describing what he does. Um, he's not connected with Hemlock, but it's very helpful to know he's around because it's hard to find a doctor who will actually take you through these steps. It's not a one-shot deal where somebody comes in the last five minutes of your life. It isn't. Uh, it's something to prepare for. And so with that, I present Dr. Bob Uslander, who we call Dr. Bob. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I don't like these things. I'm just going to... Well, just stand up. I'm going to stand <laughs> Do it out of the way. So just, um, if I could, uh, can I see a show of hands for people who are uh, supportive of the End of Life Option Act? <laughs> <laughs> can I see a show of hands for people who are opposed to it? Dare you, if you dare. How about anyone, how about people who are sort of uncertain, unsure? Is anyone unsure how they feel about it? So a couple. So the vast majority of you are in favor of personal choice, I'm assuming. Personal choice of how, when, where to die if you are faced with that. Good, okay. So we're, we're all friendlies, right? So we can talk very openly um, because I am also very much in favor. I'm not necessarily in favor of you know, the act of assisted suicide. I never actually use the word suicide. I am in favor of people being able to determine what, what should happen for them in their own lives, right? And especially, well, for always, but especially people who have lived uh, good lives and, and are now facing a, a, a certain death, and a, and a death that is, un, that is most likely going to be a struggle, because most of the time there are struggles, and, and those struggles can often be avoided, right? And, and I think that's, that's the kind of the, the overarching theme of what I do, is I try to help people avoid the struggles when they can be um, avoided. Just real quickly, my background, um, I'm from the Midwest, I went to medical school at UCLA, escaped the Midwest, came out and found, you know, Nirvana. LA wasn't necessarily Nirvana, but um, <laughs> I, my training is in emergency medicine. I was an ER doctor for 20 years. And I transitioned a few years ago from doing emergency medicine to working, to doing palliative care and hospice. So I realized after 20 years of trying to save people at all costs and living in that world and that, that, that life, to trying to be, uh, a, to be able, being able to support people who were dealing with complex illnesses and a, a, approaching end of life. I had some personal experience that, that kind of uh, influenced that. And then I started going into people's homes and caring for them at, at the end of their life or through complex issues. And I was doing that in the traditional model with a traditional hospice and palliative care company. And I realized that there are still huge, huge gaps that exist and that people are still not having their, their needs met well. So I started my own practice of doing this on a private basis, taking the, the middleman out of it and helping to guide patients and families. And I, was, I had been doing that for six months or so when the law in California passed the end of life option. And my, my anticipation was that, well, good, that's great. We're moving in the right direction. This is a good thing. Now doctors will be able to help their patients better, have another option for them. 
I was really surprised when I started getting phone calls shortly after that or right around the time from family members of patients who were looking to exercise their legal right but couldn't find a physician who would do it. Even the doctors who had been taking care of people for 20 years, who knew them, who were like family to them, said, I, I can't, I won't do it, I can't do it. And patients, people were calling 15, sometimes 20 doctors just to find someone who would, who would help them through this. And so I realized, well, this is, you know, there's a need here. There's an, an, another unmet need. Mm -hmm. And so I made myself available. And, you know, I wasn't sure how I was going to necessarily approach it, but I had the first few people and I sat with them and I learned about their plight. And I was like, how could I not help them? How could I not? And then I, I became very comfortable <laughs> assessing the situation, learning the process, working with the pharmacies, finding other physicians who could, could help in the consulting model, educating other physicians about the, the realities of this. And I guess I've become sort of the de facto Southern California expert in this because I am, as far as I know, the only physician who isn't affiliated with, an, with a system that will allow people to go down this path. And so I've now evaluated 32, 33 patients and written prescriptions for about 28 of them and been with about 20 of them as they took the medication and, and their lives ended. So it's been pretty powerful. And I know a lot about this and I'm, uh, and I can, so I can speak very, very, um, in great detail and answer the questions. And um, so one thing I can assure people is that it doesn't have to be so cumbersome. It sounds, when you look at it, when you listen to all the steps, it really sounds like it's a lot. And I think part of the reason that some physicians don't, aren't willing to do this is because they also feel like it's really cumbersome and involved. And it should be somewhat involved, right? It's not the kind of thing you wouldn't want to just sit down and sit at, go, go to like the minute clinic and ask for a prescription and then come back in 15 days and ask again and, and because a lot goes into it. A lot of, a lot of understanding, there's, there's a lot of discussion that needs to happen. Not so much with the patients. I can tell you, I can assure you that every individual patient who has approached me is, is completely certain there is not, there is, there's been no hesitancy in their minds. They're ready. And they may not be ready to take the medication and, and be done in, in today or in two weeks, but they're ready to have it. They're ready because they know that something is going to happen and they want to be prepared. The, the, I can also share with you what happened. There, there's two groups. There's the groups of patients who come because they're struggling so much right now and, and they've already lost so much and they know that every single day is another, um, you know, they wake up every day wishing that they didn't wake up. And so, so every minute is a struggle and they can't wait. That 15 days is like forever for them. And as soon as they get the medication, they want it and they, and they want to take it. And then there's this other group of people who don't, who aren't ready, who just want to have access to it. They want to know that the prescription's there or they want to know it's on their shelf so that when things do change, if they change, that they'll have, that it'll be ready. It's insurance for them. It's peace of mind and it's comfort. Uh, and I would say it's probably been about even. The, the, the real unfortunate situation is when you do find somebody, like Faye mentioned, who is very ready, they're very appropriate, and they may not have 15 days to wait. They may not be able to, to they may, they, you, they, you may be aware that things are changing so fast that they are competent and capable today but in 15 days, they will no longer be able to, to do what they need to do that to, to, you know, to take part in it. Um, so there are other options for them, and we have those conversations, and we guide them on a different path, um, which we can also touch on. I think it would be important to touch on, on that. Uh, with respect to the time frame with the, the six month, the terminal condition, very difficult to predict, right? There are some people who you can, who an experienced physician can look at and, and say, yeah, yeah, I mean, you've got a month or two. And there are some people who could 
potentially die within six months. It wouldn't necessarily be surprising. But it also wouldn't be surprising if they lived for another year or two. In those situations, if, it, if it's clear that that year of two or li of life is going to be interminable and, and horrible, I know physicians are willing to recognize it's a gray area. And no, and, and no, no one's going to, no one's going to be held. I mean, if somebody just is initially diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease and they have no other physical conditions and they're just getting, you know, confused, it's hard to put that one. You know, it's hard to qualify that one. But if somebody's got Parkinson's disease and they're still mentally competent and their their condition is is you know changing, they started falling or they they're start, they, they're not responding to their medication. Well, that person could live for several years. Potentially, or they could continue on this rapid decline and and die. And if they're really, if that person's really wanting this option, I'm going to be willing to support them versus worry about the, you know, the risk. Because because what's the risk? The risk is if they get the medication and they end up taking it, and, and if two doctors, if another doctor is of the same mind and, and agrees. Well, if they get the medication and they decide that life is, is not worth, that it doesn't have enough quality, they take the medication, well, no one really knows if they were going to live more than six months. If they get the prescription and they end up not filling it and things can keep go on and eight months pass, a year passes, no one's going to go take the prescription away from them. Right? So I feel like this is one of those gray areas and you don't really know how, how it's going to play out for an individual until you have those conversations talk to their, you know, consult with their neurologists and uh, it's an interesting thing, you know, communicating with people's other doctors as well because uh, you never quite know where they're, where they're going to stand on it. A lot of physicians, I think 70% of physicians of the medical community is in favor of this option. I, I imagine that the vast majority of probably 70% of physicians would say that they would want this option for themselves. Mm -hmm. What, so the reasons why more physicians aren't participating are twofold. One, they work for organizations that won't allow them to. So a lot of hospices say we don't participate. Uh, uh, religious affiliated organiz organizations, <coughs> government federally funded organizations, things like that. And just some that feel like it's too controversial, they don't want to, so they, they, they have a, uh, um, a limitation. And the other are doctors who just feel like it's going to be too cumbersome, take too much time, and and too, they're, they're uncomfortable with it, and so they just don't, they're not going to go there. Um, <coughs> as far as finding the consulting position, that can be a bit challenging, uh, but I would say 70% of the time when I've actually called and spoken to somebody's primary doctor or oncologist or neurologist, somebody who knows the patient well, and I tell them that I'm taking this on, I'm going to want to be the, the, mm -hmm. the attending physician, mm -hmm. take the responsibility for counseling the family and writing the prescription. All you need to do is, say, is sign the form that says they're competent and they're terminal. <coughs> and that's it. And if those things are true, that's all you have to do. And, and yeah, check a box that says that they know that if they take this medication, they'll, they'll likely die. So it's pretty simple and I'm able to help them see that it is relatively simple. And, and if not, then there's a couple other physicians here in San Diego that I uh, have collaborated with in other areas that will go out and see patients and be their consulting physician. So, I, so it, it doesn't have to be a, a terribly involved thing. I, I, you know, I'm having two discussions this afternoon, two phone consultations with family members to ask to find out about the process. and. And if everything, from my standpoint, looks okay, and we, we agree, I can see that patient you know, tomorrow. They can have the second visit 15 days from then. I, in the meantime, will determine if I think they qualify, get some records to, to confirm things, find the consulting doctor, give them the, the patient, the family member, the, the form for them to, to sign and get witnessed. 15 days later or whatever time frame after that, I have the second visit and the prescription's written. And it's, that's it. It's, it's, if, you, if you go and ask a doctor at UCSD 
and, or a Kaiser or at Scripps, some of these other organizations who actually say that they that they do support um, patients, it's often come into the come into the the office, have the consultation, get referred to a psychiatrist. Here you get a referral to the ethicist, and it's an ongoing kind of it, it is a bit cumbersome, or and, and sometimes it never happens, and sometimes the process gets delayed to the point where the patient's no longer able to to follow through. So it's frustrating, um, and again, it doesn't it doesn't need to be that way. Um, I cover the prescriptions and the cost. Good. So there's two. There are two <coughs> prescriptions that are currently being used. One of them is Secanol, Secobarbital. It's a barbiturate. It's a very potent sleeping medication. Most of you probably remember it. It was around. 60s, 70s, used pretty regularly, sold for a dollar a pill, and called Reds, I think. I know that only because I was with a 95-year-old patient whose 65-year-old son was opening the capsules and preparing it, and he told me he used to sell those on the street. <laughs> <laughs> so that's called Secanol, and it comes in, in capsules. It's 100 capsules of 100 milligrams, and those capsules need to be opened, and anybody can open them. It's usually a family member who's doing that. It takes about 15, 20 minutes, and you pour the powder in a bowl, and it gets mixed with water, and uh, four or five ounces of water. It tastes horrible. It tastes horrible. People have tried to mix it with, with juice, or put it in with applesauce, or they've tried all kinds of things, and nothing helps. It just tastes horrible. Not one person has had trouble getting it down. When you're at that point, if you're, if you're holding, you know, and I usually separate it into two smaller amounts and let somebody take a chaser in between. Um, but if you're at that point and you have the medication, you're not, the, yeah, you're gonna get it down, right? Um, that costs currently about $3,500 for the prescription. I think it used to be, able to be about 50 bucks. And then it's, it's only manufactured by one company, Valiant Pharmaceuticals, and they, uh, the, they had increased the price to about fifteen hundred dollars, and then when the law passed in California, they raised it to thirty over three thousand. God bless America. They're, can, they're Canadian. So, so the um, the other combination, the other medication that's being used, and this is it's been sort of a, a project to develop the best formula, and I've been part of that. There were, there's doctors in Washington, Oregon, and. California, who are pooling their information and sharing, you know, sharing data, and this is a, it's called DDMP2, it's, and the, it stands for diazepam, digoxin, um, morphine, and propranolol. So there's four medications: morphine, 15 grams of morphine. So you know, typically someone's going to take 10 or 15 milligrams of morphine if they have a, if they have pain. So there's a thousand times that dose. Valium, uh, like a similarly hundreds of times the normal dose, and then two medications that are toxic to the heart, digoxin and propranolol. And in high doses, those can cause a heart block. And, and um, So this medication is, costs around six to $700, and it comes in a powder. It's, it comes from a compounding pharmacy in a powder form. Also gets mixed with about the same amount of water, and the volume is about the same. It also tastes horrible. Um, the difference between these medications, well, the, si the similarities are they both kill you. You die universally 100% of the time, right? Um, with the second all, people tend to fall asleep a bit sooner, usually four to five minutes mm -hmm. into a deep sleep. The other medication, it could be five minutes, it could be 10 to 12 minutes. Usually it's pretty quick though. Second all, people usually um, just gently, peacefully stop breathing and fade away and die within 20 to 30 minutes. There have been some longer, um, but in, it, most of the time it's 20 to 30 minutes. The other combination, the range is much more variable, and, and that's the issue. Some people, if they're very ill and, and, and um, uh, compromised, they may die in 30 to 40 minutes, but there are people who will uh, who will still be breathing with a heartbeat for up to several hours. But unconscious. But unconscious. So the patient, the person who's taking the medication, for them the difference is probably negligible. For the family members and the people who are there watching and supporting them, the difference can be significant. And, and the patients that I've, the families that I've counseled, 
Um, I've told them if that difference, that difference in between those two medications, that cost difference isn't going to be hard for you, isn't going to have a, a negative impact some, in some other way, I would go with the higher, with, with the more expensive because mm -hmm. it is so certain and quick. I hate supporting a company that does that, mm -hmm. so that's my only issue. <laughs> and knowing that the cost can be an issue for people, but I, I know that what it's like to be the family member watching somebody struggle. And, and, and even though they don't, they're not knowing that they're struggling, with that other medication, there can be some gasping, there can be some other movements. I've seen both. And I would, with the other one. With second oil, it's totally smooth, done, out. The other combination, it can be that way. And, I'm, and I'm, we're continuing to, to tweak and look for other things that could get, that, that could be more quick. Um, you know, I, wouldn't it be nice if we could just do what we do with our animals? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right? Have yeah. You know, I mean, when it comes right yeah. down to it, Why too? because it's illegal, yeah. and it would be like murder. Uh, do better. We can't because we have a fearful society that, yeah. and, and I'm sure there's many other issues that are. I, I'm happy that we're moving in the direction that we're moving. That's a good step forward. Mm -hmm. we'll, hopefully, we'll get to that point someday. Bob, you want to take questions? No, I'm done. Oh, choice. Oh, I was asking if, if, if the veterinarians are using secanol now. They're using some form of barbiturate, then, you know, phenobar. There, there's other forms. Um, I know that the, I, I met a couple of ladies several months ago who wanted to talk to me about kind of end of life paperwork mm -hmm. and things. And they had gone down several years ago, they had gone down to Mexico and went to a vet who sold, you know, vials. Of the of barbiturates, something like sec. Well, it was nem nembutol or something like that. Mm -hmm. They're no longer doing that. They've they've uh, is this, they've made is that this illegal. worldwide that you can't get second all. No. I don't know. You don't know. I don't know. I mean, I th they use it in other countries. Use it everywhere. They use it in other countries. Yeah. Who, who in, do participate in Switzerland, in this. it's uh, it's uh, sixty dollars or something is for it? the same dose that is thirty five hundred dollars here. So. Well, there's a lot of things we can talk about about yeah. how things can be improved. Yeah. Seems Anything to else? Me fentanyl would work very nicely. Yeah, well, they started using fentanyl. They started adding some fentanyl to the DDMP mixture here, and there and and there were a few patients who just very smoothly, very quickly. It seemed like it was wonderful. We're dying from it all then, the time. And then the next person who who uh, was given to lasted six and a half hours. <laughs> so it's variable. How people respond to these medications is variable, but. The pay, but the, the individual, I, I mean, these, these, these deaths are incredibly peaceful. They're incredibly peaceful from all standards. I'm going to be sure I understand this. Are you saying that if you can afford it, if you have the money, second all is available? Because I've heard. Yeah, it's available. Absolutely. Mm. Yeah. But Kaiser will pay for it, Medi Cal pays for it. Some insurance yeah, companies pay for it. Medi-Cal may say they pay for it, and, but I know the pharmacists have had a very difficult time getting reimbursed from Medi-Cal. And, and so they're very reluctant to, to, to even submit it because if they do that, then they're required to give the prescription, but the pharmacies will often not get reimbursed in, in that case or not for six months or eight months. So that's difficult. Some insurance companies may, and it's worth putting it through to see if you can get authorization. Uh, but I think very few of them will mm -hmm. at this point. May, that, then that will hopefully change. Of course, there's always this concern that if insurance companies start paying for the prescriptions, people are worried that they're going to like, be encouraging people to get those prescriptions so that they just spend the $3,500 and don't have to keep paying for these people to be on hospice or, that's sort of a cynical view of things. People are not being coerced or influenced. Insurance companies are not going to, to somehow influence a person to, to believe that they should end their life, right? I mean, I guess you could, if, if the insurance company is denying coverage for, for certain things, that they feel like would be important for their quality of life, but they will cover the, you know, end of life, the, the end of life option. I don't know. I'm kind of I have kind of mixed feelings about about whether I think insurance should be 
paying for it. And I think it would be helpful for people to get the, the relief, but in, I I'll kind of also think that insurance companies should just be kept out of this kind of yeah. stuff, yeah. right? Yeah. It, gets too, it gets too convoluted, I don't trust them. Um, it, would it be illegal to just give someone so much morphine they stopped breathing? Is that illegal? For who to do that? Uh, the patient? Could it, the, patient the patient could do it. Um, it's, it's not illegal for a patient to take an overdose of morphine. And for the first two, I'll be honest, the first two patients that I, that I took care of in this, I thought, well, they've never been on morphine, they've never been on pain medication. They're, one was a 65-year-old with ALS, the other had an advanced form of Parkinson's disease. That's what I used. I gave them high doses of morphine with some, something to help them get to sleep. And then the morphine eventually stops their breathing. And it worked well in less than an hour. The next person, I did the same thing, even gave her a little morphine. She was, she was 93, weighed 82 pounds, and it took her 21 hours to die. I stopped, you. I stopped that practice. So, so you never know. That's the problem with these opiates. It could be just a little bit somebody could take, and, and it could stop their breathing, or they could vomit and, and obstruct their airway. Or you could take massive doses and, and it could either take a long time or you could have complications and, and you know, and you could, it could not have the effect that you're looking for. So I'd be cautious about that. How long is a prescription good for? And do you actually have to select a date that was said earlier that you're going to use it? No. Can you repeat the question? The question was, um, how long is the prescription good for and does a person have to select a date? So. I'll start with the, first, the second que question. You don't, you don't have to select a day. You don't have to take the medication. I let people know you, you never, this is just a choice. It's, an, it's another option. It's, it's, a, it's insurance for some people. Uh, and they can either never get the prescription filled or they can get the prescription filled and just have it, have it available. Even if you get the medication and you mix it and it's in your hand, you, you can always change your mind. You can't change your mind once you're drunk. Mm -hmm. Then it's too late. Prescription is good for six months, although, and that the pharmacy will probably only honor it for six months. Another prescription can be written after six months. I don't, and I wouldn't make the person go through the process again. It doesn't like the clock for me wouldn't start over. I'm not sure how other doctors approach this. It's not specifically addressed in, in the law as far as I know. Um, but I would say I would, I would want to meet or communicate with the patient again to make sure that they're still competent. I think that would be my, I, I would probably need at least that to know that I'm not prescribing the medication for someone who's not competent to take it. Um, the consulting point. Okay. And they could have seen the patient weeks, you know, weeks before. Repeat the question. Uh, he's asking about the timing for when the consulting physician sees the patient. Um, and there is no requirement. It could be, uh, sometimes I'll just have a, a consulting physician will be someone who, a primary doctor who saw the patient three weeks before and knows that their condition and knows that they're competent and doesn't even need to you know, see the patient again. They should have a conversation with them so that they can at least know that the patient understands what they're asking about and is, is familiar with it. Most of the time it's good for them to actually have a face-to-face a -face and the six months to live, which is of course great, but there are certain rules uh, in general. Do you consult with specialists sometimes? I wouldn't, I don't consult with a specialist to get a prognosis. I'm pretty, I've been doing this for a long time and I feel comfortable that I can say, would I be surprised if this person died in six months? And if the answer is yes, then I, then I need to really give a lot of thought to it, would I be surprised if that in eight months? Or um, if so, some doctors might feel like they need to get input from the specialist. I'll always look at the patient's notes from their visits, look at their scan reports, things like that. And I have patients that are that are that are still on treatment. There's people with brain tumors who are still taking chemotherapy, and and even though they have they they have deficits or they have issues. We don't really know what, what the outcome of that treatment is going to be. I know with you know with a glioblastoma, I know the incidence, the, I know the statistics. Yeah, yeah, there's certain things like that. But there's others that 
that, and I'm, I'm a friendly, right? I'm not saying that I will ever lie, but I will sometimes be a little bit more liberal about that. And I think most phys physicians are, who, who will be comfortable with this are gonna be a little bit more um, comfortable making that kind of estimation. You know what, you know what I mean? I don't want to like it. Uh, <laughs> did you have a question? No. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm, I'm talking about. Call me. I'll talk to you. You can't do anything. You can't do anything related to the the end of life option, right? Yeah. And um, every situation is going to be a little bit different, and that's a conversation that probably shouldn't happen in front of a group of people. But there are, you know, there's things to consider. There's things to consider. Okay. What do, what Neurologic conditions, um, not people. Not dementias, I understand that. Yeah, no, not. COPD and emphysema. Right. And, and any of those conditions as well as Yep. Strokes. People who have had, again, advanced heart disease, if you've had multiple heart and attacks. Is, is that or, with or without continuing treatment? It, either way. I mean, I think, I think if somebody, it depends. I think there's a case to be made for either. If somebody, if somebody says, you know what, I've been doing this for too long and I'm, and, I, and I'm tired and I don't want to keep doing treatment and I feel comfortable that if they stop treatment, within six months they're likely to die, they can keep doing treatment. I'm not suggesting that they have to stop doing treatment, but if they, it, you know, if they say, I'm, I'd like to stop doing treatment, then to me that probably would qualify them. But it's, each case is going to be different, right? Could I just make a plug? I'm sorry. This Sunday at the Scottish Rite Center in Mission Valley, we're having a program with five doctors. Bob will be there and um, Dr. Cedarquist from UCSD, a couple of hospice doctors, most of them in favor of it, one not. And you can find out what their hospice situations are and how to access them. Uh, it's uh, because we've gained a lot of ground in the year that this law has been in effect, these hospices have now come on board. So we know at least four hospices that will work with the patient in their hospice, and some who will not. So that's this Sunday at 1.30. And also, our big conference on November 4th, our all-day conference, looks at other issues. Um, dementia, for example, and ways out of that, uh, looks at ways to, uh, non-medical ways, a final exit network, going to Switzerland. It's not, we're not just stuck with this law and its rigidity, because it doesn't have to be rigid, as Dr. Bob says. So uh, we try to educate you with all the options, so you're not stuck in a rigid uh, situation where you say, I cannot have a peaceful death because, I'm not eligible for this or that. So there's more to come, <laughs> and Bob will certainly talk. And we'll more. segue into that. I just I wanted to answer any other specific questions about about aid and dying. Um, this, this is a this question law. about ALS. A friend of mine is dying. Okay. So I'll also I'll share that, um, and I'm not sure many people talk about this, but if somebody loses their ability to swallow, but they're still competent, they we can have an NG tube. A, to, a gastric tube, a tube just kind of temporarily put down through their nostril to their stomach, which sometimes happens when people are in the hospital for a, a bowel obstruction or to get fed. Mm -hmm. And it's not terribly uncomfortable. And it, the, the patient has, the medication can be mixed up and put into a large syringe, which is how people often get their feedings. Mm -hmm. um, and the patient just needs to be able to kind of depress in some way the, the plunger of that syringe to put the medication in. So not being able to swallow, or speak is not, it, it doesn't disqualify you by any means. Is the second all available in Canada? Or Probably. What? Probably. And, because they're just best right to die with all. Yeah, I'm assuming that it's available. I don't know if it's less expensive or, I mean, most medications are less expensive in Canada. So I don't know <coughs> the answer and to that. And if one had a contact in Switzerland, one get it through contact? Possibly. I don't know. 
I do know, but this is not the time to talk okay. about it. Okay, talk to Faye. Thank you. Can you talk about mental competency? Sure. With respect to this in particular? Yes. So the per, uh, in order for a person to qualify, they have to be mentally competent, meaning they have to, uh, I need to be comfortable that they understand the consequences of their decisions <laughs> that they're asking. They don't have to be able to, you know, to subtract by sevens from 100 or recite the Declaration of Independence. They, they can have short-term memory loss. They can have, you know, dementia. As long as, long as I know that what, that, and when, and the consulting physician is also comfortable that that person is able to make um, informed decisions. That they know that if they get a prescription for this medication and ingest it, that their life will end. If they know that, if I'm comfortable that that's clear to them, they're competent for this. Okay. It may not be the legal definition of competency or capacity. It is. They know the consequences of it. That I mean, would mean is at some point somebody would have to in, enact and go through enact this for on your behalf. Yes. No, it can't. It has to be the individual. The individual has to make the requests and has to be competent to do that at the time. Another person can't can't do that process for you. Make the requests on your behalf, even if. Yes, except you're not terminal. You don't have a six month prognosis which means you also don't qualify. But if the doctor will they won't. State, they won't. They won't. They won't. No, because, because if, we try to, if, if we start stretching that and we say, you know, you would qualify based on that, we're going to, it, it's going to come back to bite us. And, and we will, I, don't, I mean, I don't think we can, yeah, it, it will. It, I would lose my license, I would lose my reputation, I would, it, it's just, we can't do that. But I can. Let me just interject yeah. here. This is the area where the law needs to be fixed. It may take several years, but this is where we need to work. You need to talk to your legislators about it because this has to happen in Sacramento. We need to be able to get to the point where our proxy, our agent, and our advanced directive is able to make the decision for us when we become incompetent because of dementia or for any other reason. So it's a continuum. As Faye said earlier, it's 30 years we've been in this, and we may have another 30 years to go. Here's where we are now, but keep thinking about where we need to go. I can give you a long list. <laughs> of places we need to go? Yeah. Yeah. I would like to add that. See, I mean, you can demand to be moved and insist on being moved to another facility. Uh, what, you know? It, it, they don't like to lose patients because they lose money. <laughs> Ani, you can not say in your advance directive that I demand to use the End of Life Option Act in a Catholic hospital. That you know, the complete it's completely voluntary. Hospices, doctors, um, uh, medical systems can refuse to use the act. So you would have to not go to that hospital if you but thought... But if I was in a car accident in some oh. godforsaken place and the nearest hospital was a Catholic hospital, they wouldn't do that. That's right. No, they will listen to your advance directive either. So, yeah. No, you um, want to make sure you don't wind up there. It's going to be on your family. <laughs> yes. What is your opinion of... Okay. Um, and if, we, if there's anything else specific to the End of Life Option Act, we can, we can cover that. But I think, um, I think we're also moving to a place where we, as a society, need to let people know there's this, there's this secret that's out there that some people are aware of, and I'm amazed that more people aren't. But everybody has the legal right to stop eating and drinking and allow their life to come to a dignified and peaceful end. Mm -hmm. That's called v -SED. There's a bunch of names for it, but one of them is voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. When somebody you stops, that, yes, Vol yes, sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry, Volun v -SED. voluntarily stopping eating and drinking. Every competent adult has the right, the legal right, to not 
eat, or drink. And that is an incredibly 100% effective way to, end, to, to allow your life to come to an end. People are sometimes afraid of, of what that would be like to die after a period of starvation, dehydration, and I think it's just sort of because that's the, the media portrays it as, as, as horrible, and most people, when you think about uh, dehydration and starvation, it's, it's usually forced upon people. When it's done voluntarily, it is incredibly peaceful. And, and when it's done with the right support of your family members and the people around you in the medical community, it is a, a, it's a, it's a gift. And a, you have the control, every one of us has the control to stop the, whatever we're having to go through by not eating and drinking. I have a gentleman right now who's a patient who's in day, day five. The four days leading up to today, I haven't seen him today, but each day I've visited and spent some time with him. And it's interesting because he's in a place of ultimate peace mm -hmm. because he has a, a, an advanced form of Parkinson's and he's 80 and he's becoming more and more limited in his ability. He started falling and he, he has a son who he's close with, but he's in a, he's in a facility that because he can't take care of his own needs. And he knows that this is continuing to happen. He has done the research. He, uh, con through another person, contacted me and said, will you support me? I know what I'm gonna do. I've read the books. I've got the whole you know, thing laid out. Will you help me make it easier? And I said, of course. So this is, this is a, a very dignified and very real option for people. Only if you have support, really. I mean, don't just decide you're gonna do it, close the door and stop eating and drinking without anybody there, because it will not be that peaceful not be and easy. nice and Correct. everything else. Thank you You for must that. have support, hospice or Bob or somebody. I mean, you can read pretty horrible accounts of what it's like too. It's not always sweetness and light. Yeah. So it's essential that you have support if you're going to do this. <laughs> and when it's supported the right way, then you can avoid the struggle, okay? And I'm not, I, I, I would never suggest somebody to do that. Right? That's not my role. I just want people to see the options that are available to them. Because the idea of being trapped in your body, and in a body that's, that's in pain all the time, that's completely limited, and, and where you're feeling like life is an ongoing struggle, and, there's no, and it's just not going to get any better no matter what, then, then we really, as, as a society, you know, owe it to people to help them see what the options are. This option only for people, the patient who is mentally competent? Yes and no. At present, so, so it is completely legal to stop eating and drinking. It's, a, it's legal in this country. It's legal. It's legal. legal. As of 1990, Supreme and, Court decision. Right. And, it, and actually, if somebody tries to, if, if you're a competent person and somebody tries <coughs> to feed you, or force you to take liquids or, or mm -hmm. put tubes in or whatever, it's illegal, that's, a, that's battery, okay? And they can, be, they can be arrested and prosecuted. If, so for people who are not competent. What about health proxy in that case? <laughs> it has to be clearly spelled out in your documents. It has to be clearly, if you, if you have advanced directive, and Bill should, should speak to this as well, if you have an advanced directive that says specifically, if I can, you know, and you itemize it, if I can no longer recognize who I am, if I no longer am able to communicate with my family. Should be one of those. If, if, you know, if whatever, and we have, I have examples of documents that, we, that were put together for this. Then I desire to, I'll be allowed to die a natural death if I'm not, if I am not taking food and water voluntarily, I reject. I, I mean, nobody is to do that, right? And that's basically a, becomes a legal addition to your advanced directive. And there is, I, I, tru, I truly don't know all the legalities of that. If there's, if a family member who's supporting a loved one in this case, if somebody wanted to go after them and make an example if there's a possible legal ramification. I, I know that um, 
it's, it, I don't think it's been tested. That's correct. So it's not, let me jump in here. It has not been tested. The, the lawyers that are interested in what, in, in dying with dignity, have looked at this and feel that with the proper documentation, that other people should be able to implement your instructions. There are some lawyers, including me, that feel that you, you really should start the process yourself. A couple of days where you're denying food, and then the others can take over and withhold food and fluid from you. It's really fluid, not food, that counts. So it's an unknown area in terms of actual court decisions, but the lawyers are fairly comfortable with the long documentation. There's a doctor by the name of Terman who's uh, got a whole book about how to write the documents that you need to protect, to, to accomplish this. But you don't have to follow all his stuff. You do need a clear record, as Bob said, that this is what your wish is. And I have, I have samples of, of a document that was actually created by a 101-year-old year retired physician for this purpose. And something happened, and she wants to make sure that everyone knows, do not feed me, do not you know, give me fluids, allow me to have a natural support at death, but you know, give, me the, give me the right support around that. There's a document that will also apply if you're demented and you're not competent, that you don't want your institution to feed you, and that's still not clear in court, and it applies especially to spoon feeding, which can perpetuate your life forever. Yeah. So you have to say no spoon feeding and hope, and if you have a chance, a parent, or somebody's going into an institution, to talk to that institution and see if they will follow such a document. I mean, mine says no treatment at all. There's a recent, uh, based on an advanced directive in the Harvard Law Review by a known legal scholar, and it also says no spoon feeding. But as, as Bill said, it has not been tested in court. But it's a good idea to talk to any institution that you might be dealing with uh, that deals with dementia to see whether they'll do that. Let me throw in one more thing. If, if that's the direction you're going, it's important that everybody in your family understands that right. that's your wish. Because when things get in court, it's because a family member or a branch of your family doesn't like what happened or what's about to happen, and you get litigation within the family. It's really important to have family conversations about what you want, and if this is your wish, and you reach certain stages, you want to stop eating and drinking, you need to have your family at least understand and not fight you on it. The issue of, of the facilities is an important one. Most, most facilities are going to um, not be comfortable with holding nourishment. Mm -hmm. And very, very occasionally you'll get one that, that will be sensitive and it's, it's a lot of it's individualized. Um, the smaller ones probably are a little bit more likely to support people, the little six bed RCFEs, but large institutions often have you know, they're worried about liability, they're worried about regulations, and uh, so sometimes people need to take their loved ones out of the facilities uh, at a certain point and care for them at home. Could, could you, you know, okay, could you find what an RCFE? Sorry, an RCFE, residential care facility for the elderly, and those are like assisted, assisted living, uh, and they could, be, they could be places that have hundreds of units, apartments, and there's a, a lot of, of smaller ones that have maybe six or eight uh, residents living in a private home. You had a question in the back. You mentioned that a lot of it is helping them understand the whole what that process will look like, what the how things will play out most of the time, how they'll feel on you know day one, two, three, what additional support they would need to have there in terms of home care, nursing care whether hospice makes sense at that stage or not. Um, a lot of it is having conversations with the family members who are questioning this and don't really understand uh, to answer their questions. Not to, not to make it seem okay. I'm not trying to influence anybody. I'm just trying to give people the information that they're seeking 
and, and in some cases to allay fears about the possibility of this being really, really, really difficult. Because if, you're, if, if somebody is really paying close attention to what's happening day to day, as a person slides into this place of being unconscious because of dehydration sets in, um, they can be medicated for comfort very well. And they should be. There are some people who say, no, I don't want to be medicated. I want to be fully aware as long as possible and, and uh, you know, as, of this whole journey that I'm on. There's a spiritual component for some people. Um, and I just make sure that they say, okay, so once you're, you, you, it's all, you, it's your, under, under your control. The nice thing about that, this option, this, the, the V said, is that it's your own doing. No one's making that decision. It's an organic process. It's a natural process. There isn't like this build up to this one moment when someone's gonna ingest something that they know there's no turning back from. If on day two, they say, you know what? I'm feeling like today's a good day for a steak. <laughs> <laughs> then they can do that. I had a patient, one of the first person I actually helped through this process a few years ago, and he had Alzheimer's, and he was uh, in his mid 80s, and it was, it was kind of early to moderate Alzheimer's, so he was forgetting a lot of things. He was, he, he, I mean, he couldn't be alone. He, had, he was so frustrated because he'd been a very independent, you know, very accomplished guy. At 82, he ran a marathon. <laughs> so physically, he was an incredible specimen, but he was no longer able to like, carry on conversations without you know, stumbling. So he decided he did not want to put his family through years of having to care for him. And he, decided, he wanted to you know, do it his way. Unfortunately, he mentioned this to a psychologist who, who then kind of ratted him out and sent him to a psych ward because he was suicidal. The place where he was living, they, they, they nailed his doors shut and they said that he could not be alone. He couldn't wander through the high-end community that he was paying, I don't know how many, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to live there. And so he became, you know, of course, depressed. Well, of course he'd become depressed. And so his wife, I, w I gave a presentation, and this is like two, three years ago, so my presentation was really just about palliative care. What is palliative care and how do we support people? And she came up after and said, I got a situation, maybe you can kind of chat with us. So I went up and I met with them and I met with him and he had said, what can you do? How can you help me? And, and, they, and he had already come around to this. I want to stop eating and drinking. I know that's my, my, my choice. And he did have enough capacity to do that. Um, but he changed his mind. So, oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, <laughs> so, uh, so we, they decided what the day is going to happen. His kids came to visit, the grandkids, everyone came and they said goodbye. And so on Sunday, he stopped eating and drinking. And on Monday, I went to check and see how he was doing. And I, and I went up and expecting that you know, he's going to be weaker and things have changed. And, and I found out that, well, he did eat or drink on Sunday, but then Sunday evening he forgot <laughs> that he wasn't eating and drinking, so he asked for a martini. <laughs> so his wife gave him a martini and kind of reset things. And then after that, he remembered and and everyone supported him. And and he was in a facility. There were some challenges around that because at certain facilities, once if they know this is happening, they want their nurses to hold on to the medications, and it's it's so much nicer if it can all be sort of kept out of the hands of, of the mm -hmm. management and the facilities to do it in, this, in, in a setting that's really private and, and well supported. Mm -hmm. so. Sorry, so this can be done at home? It should be done at home. Mm -hmm. if you have the, it, assuming that you have the, the, the people that will be there to support you. And the support that would entail, like somebody, I mean, If he's competent, he's so if he's really competent to know what this is what he wants and, and uh, you have to, that's a, that's a bit of a delicate thing. The most important thing is to make sure that you're addressing their comfort issues. So swabbing the mouth, a little, spray, a little mist spray bottle to keep the mouth moist. The body has a thirst mechanism that kicks in when, when you're dehydrated and your mouth gets dry and it's telling you to drink. If you moisten the mouth or even give a couple of ice chips, you can actually fool the brain into thinking that it's being hydrated. 
And so those, ur those cravings, those urges can pass. Hunger pains usually go away within a, within a day. I typically get people on a little bit of a, of a patch of some pain medication just to keep them a little bit evenly, just feeling good, and then they have access to some little liquid Ativan and medications just to be comfortable. And, and I'm, I'm actually reading a really interesting, um, I've, I've been reading a lot about, about this because it's being you know, asked about more often. And it, it, what happens if you're, as your body starts to go through its, its energy stores, it, usually it goes through, through the sugars and then it goes through the stores that are in the liver, and then it starts breaking down muscle. Mm -hmm. And that creates what's called ketosis. It, ca it creates this sort of, a little bit of underlying euphoria. So it's almost like a little natural anesthetic. And, and, and so for the first, after like the first 24 hours, like as you start getting into the second, third, fourth day, people are typically, assuming that they're not really, really cachectic or really, really ill already, they, they have this sort of, I don't know, energy and, and clear, clarity that, that I think, and they become even more convinced that this is okay. This is, this is, this is okay, I'm, I'm, I'm in a safe place and I'm going where, I, where I've mm -hmm. chosen to go and they don't end up struggling. And then as they slip into a place of being less alert and responsive, you've had the conversation with them about them requesting the comfort. What, what level of comfort do you want? And then we have, you know, we, we're guided by that. So being at home, and so as of af after the second or third day, people are usually getting pretty weak. It's hard to get up and they'd be unsteady on their feet and you really want people to be supported. Falling, breaking something would be a real horrible thing to happen at that point. So it usually requires some care caregivers who can be there to do personal care turning and changing. and 24-7, really. Yeah, you'd want to have the 24-7 starting pretty early. Yeah. And that can be done through, you know, there's... We agencies. have a lending library that we have at our... Uh, Sunday meetings, and one of the books we've just ordered is Phyllis Schachter's book, Choosing to Die. She was on, she had a TEDx program. Her husband had dementia, early dementia, and that's what he chose. The nurses that took care of him kept a journal for the nine days it took him to die, and then she made a list of all the things that you need. The whole thing turned me off completely, but <laughs> it's a good... It was too circumstantial. It was too... What, what was it about well, it that turned you off? Uh, just sounded terrible to me but anyway we have our choices and so that's a good book uh, to read the appendix and the nurses notes and the uh, things that you need to make the person comfortable in your home so we'll have it in our lending library probably this Sunday um, the most important thing to have is a doctor who's gonna yes. support you <laughs> I, and that's and I'm not I'm not promoting myself necessarily for that but I recognize how critical it is to have that right support and to have, uh, you know, to have those questions answered and to have, to know that the medications will be there <coughs> and liberally, you know, administered. He had a doctor that was so careful not to administer too much medication.